Hello class, welcome back. It's good to be with you today. Uh, today we're going to be talking about individual interventions. And as you may recall, last week we talked about interventions generally and lumped them into three broad buckets. Individual level interventions, team or group interventions, and whole organization interventions. So today we're going to focus on the first of those three and then we'll be talking about the next two in the coming weeks. Uh, as we talk about individual level interventions, and really over the next couple of weeks as we talk about each of these categories, I encourage you to think carefully about your own projects this semester and the various intervention activities that you have planned and how they might fit into each of these three buckets um, within the context of your broader intervention strategy. Generally speaking, I think it's a good idea to try to take a multi-prong approach um, to working with organizations. And sometimes we can even think of it as a three-legged stool approach, where we try to do something that's individual level, something that's group or team level, and something that's whole organization level. Um, so I can encourage you to think about that as you continue on with your projects. As we discuss individual interventions, uh, I'm going to focus uh, mostly on the following, individual instruments and assessments, coaching, mentoring, 360 feedback, and career planning and development. Um, before we jump right on in, though, I thought we could take a couple minutes and talk about the psychology of transitions. Um, it's difficult for anyone to change. Um, people almost always resist change, and it's a very rare individual or leader or organizational context where change is just immediately and wholeheartedly embraced. Um, and there's a reason for that. There's a, a psychology behind the way our brain works and uh, fight or flight and why we resist change and why we like the status quo and what's um, what's safe and what's familiar and, and all those types of things. Um, so I think it's helpful as we think about individual level work that we think about the individual level psychology that goes into um, fearing change, resisting change, and even the 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 adaptation stage that occurs as we work with people within organizations. So first, broadly speaking, we can think of it in terms of, well, really these three, endings, the neutral zone, and then new beginnings. Um, in endings, this is where we're letting go of past practices, beliefs, and relationships. Emotions include anxiety, fear, blame, shock, denial, disappointment. Acknowledge the past, good and bad, celebrating successes, conscious disintegration of the ending. So here we're, we're mourning what is ending, um, whether that's a restructure happening in the organization so that we, we know that we're going to be working with a new team or with a new boss and we're mourning the loss of our colleagues. Uh, or, or the close relationships that we'll have with them, working with them every day, um, or if it's just comfort in relation to culture, policy, practice, things that we're used to that are coming to an end and it puts us in a situation where we have to learn new things and adapt, um, that still creates these same types of uh, emotions. And this is fairly universal. Most people experience these types of things uh, as they go through this sort of a transition. As one stage ends and you move into the next stage, um, it's it's just completely normal um, that this happens. And so uh, a manager needs to understand this so that they can effectively manage through emotional intelligence. They can understand that these elements are happening and then they can address them. Uh, but most managers aren't skilled to be able to know how to do that. And so that's one thing that an OD practitioner can do is they can come in and, and on an individual level, they can have interventions aimed specifically at um, helping people let go and, and dealing with the anxiety, fear, blame, shock, denial, and disappointment. The neutral zone then, um, here we're reflecting on loss, change, and there's gradual acceptance of the transition. Emotions include confusion, uncertainty, frustration, loss of purpose, the emptiness of loss that has not yet been replaced, and the tendency to escape the state, often without conscious attention to the feelings of change. Um, so, so we need to process. We need to think about these emotions. We can't just pretend like they're not there. We can't just stick our head in the sand and pretend like nothing's happening. The, these emotions are real. Um, and we're going through the natural process of thinking about loss and change and, and gradually accepting. And if we don't go through this process, that gradual acceptance often won't occur. So it's really important that we go through this stage. And then we get to the new beginnings, 
reintegration of self, things may start to click again, we start to feel connected again. Emotions include gradually getting more comfortable, the fog is lifting, new sense of purpose and confidence within this new context that's emerged, and approaching new beginnings without the hard work of the transition state may mean making the same mistakes over and over again. So a lot of times what happens is people just put their head down, they just plow forward, they know it's going to be uncomfortable, they know it's going to be difficult, they never really process the anxiety, fear, blame, they never really process the confusion, uncertainty, frustration, and they just try to, to press forward. And the reality is, though, the way our brains work is that most of the time, uh, it, rather than actually adjusting, we, we harbor those same emotions and we, what ends up happening is we just make the same mistakes over and over again, the same resistance, the same, um, the fear and the anxiety and the frustration and the uncertainty. It's permeated throughout decisions as we continue to move forward. And this is one of the reasons why so many uh, change initiatives and why so many OD interventions ultimately fail is because this process isn't effectively managed um, and we just try to push um, employees straight through to, to that, that other side without actually going through this process. So I think that's something important for us to consider as we think about individual level change. So think about an experience with a transition that you've ever had. What did the ending stage, the neutral stage, the new beginning stage feel like for you? What do you, what did you do to move between the stages? And it's also the reality that people process things at different speeds. Um, people move through the stages at different speeds. And this doesn't just have to be a workplace type of a scenario. This can happen in various aspects of our life, uh, from individual relationships, it can happen in, in community organizations, it can be, happen within religious contexts, it certainly can happen in, within an employment situation. Um, people naturally go through these types of stages when things change and it can be difficult. So think about that and you'll have an opportunity to discuss um, in the discussion this week. So now let's talk about um, different types uh, of individual assessments and instruments. Uh, there are many out there, so things like the Myers-Briggs, um, Strengths Finder. Uh, there are many different types of personality uh, type assessments, um, and each of them have their own potential benefits. Uh, but we have to be careful because sometimes these get used as a, a one-size-fits-all kind of uh, approach, and people can get pretty darn dag dogmatic about their individual assessment of choice. Uh, I know people that are just diehard Myers-Briggs people, and it's their gospel. Like everything comes back to Myers-Briggs uh, personality types. I know people similarly with StrengthsFinder who just believe that that is the the thing that will provide all the answers for individuals and in understanding how teams work together and how to leverage the capacity of people and certainly there are benefits of these individual inter, uh, assessments and instruments um, but there are also disadvantages so so we need to be thoughtful about that and think back to the case um, for the class in connection to this um, individual level assessments can go terribly wrong if we're not careful so we have to be um, thoughtful about how we use them and how we debrief them and how we implement them. The advantages of these types of assessments is it gives people language and constructs to understand themselves. It's great for critical self-reflection. Um, there's relatively low threat. It's individualized. Allows comparison to others so they can see kind of where they fit with the team. It promotes involvement and self-discovery. It can be administered at multiple times to see changes or patterns over time, and it can allow a person to explore areas previously unknown to themselves, which is great because a lot of times we're a little bit blind to our weaknesses or blind to um, areas that maybe other people see about us all the time that we just don't we just don't see. Um, but there are disadvantages, so people may s seek the right answer or right style, quote unquote, um, thinking that there is a right answer or a right style. And let me tell you, I just don't think that's true. I think there's so much research out there that talks about effective teams, effective leaders, effective organizations, and there's no one right style. There's no one right answer on how to, you know, what, how an individual is supposed to behave. Um, you have effective leaders from all stripes and all types. Um, and so we need to be very careful to, to not be overly dogmatic. Um, may encourage labeling or stereotyping. This happens a lot. So you have to be very careful about that. 
may encourage relativism instead of confrontation or learning. Uh, fear, there's sometimes fear of being exposed or discovered, psychologically figured out that they think they're being profiled, other people are going to figure out what their weaknesses are. It can foster dependency on the facilitator rather than people actually taking the steps for critical self-reflection and self-discovery, and it can be too much information to confront at once. Uh, it can be overwhelming for people, especially if there's a lot of blind spots that that they start to shine light on. Um, so I think you need to think about not compelling participation, establishing a safe and non-judgeable atmosphere, um, practice explaining the instrument, how it is used, what it's what it assesses, how it was developed, what theories are included, how to interpret it, invite uh, participants to draw their own conclusions and take the instrument yourself um, so that you have some empathy for them. And the second to last bullet, invite participants to draw their own conclusions. I think that's really, really important. Um, don't just assume that you know everything about it, uh, about that person just because of this simple little individual assessment. Um, I don't want to take too much more time, so I'm going to um, go through these next uh, slides fairly quickly. Um, coaching, though, we basically have the opportunity through formal and informal coaching to help individuals and go through the stages uh, of, of uh, evolution and change, um, and, and we can help them through the process. Um, so think carefully about how you can coach, and I think many of you have had good coaching relationships in the past, think about how you can strengthen that even more in the future. Now I want to take a minute and talk about the Jahari window. Um, here you can see this quadrant system, unknown to others, known to others, known to self, unknown to self. So if you if something's known to others but it's unknown to self, that puts you in the blind spot quadrant. If something's unknown to others and known to self, that's the hidden spot. So those are things you know but other people don't see and you're kind of hiding from other people. Um, and if it's known to others and to yourself, it's that open window. The real danger here, um, really the hidden spots, the blind spots, we want to um, minimize, but it's also the unknown window. The bigger the unknown window, which also is increased by how big the hidden spots and blind spots are, um, the, that will increase the size of the unknown window. And the bigger the unknown window is, the more potentially dangerous it is. Um, and your interactions and understanding how to move forward. So what we want to try to do through openness, through being um, genuine and authentic and openly communicating with people is we essentially want to expand that open window that reduces the hidden area through disclosure to others, reduces your blind spots through feedback from others. And, and you also see that that unknown window shrinks as well. Uh, and I think ultimately that's what we're trying to accomplish through individual level interventions is increase and enhance that open window. Now you also have some additional opportunities uh, in the discussion this week to, to think about um, additional uh, elements of individual interventions and thinking about career development. So think about um, the stage model of career development um, what stage are you in? What stage do you see yourself moving to in the future? And how might uh, an organization and a, and a consultant help facilitate that? I think that's a really important thought process to go through for yourself, but also as a, as a consultant going in and trying to help people. Um, you can help them process that also. And then lastly, um, another thing pair share um, that you, you might have an opportunity in the, the weekly discussion online to, to explore. Have you ever had a mentor or been mentored yourself? What was the purpose and duration of the relationship? How did the mentor help you? Or how did you help your mentee? What agreements did you make about the mentoring relationship? How did you get started? How often did you meet? What role did the mentor take? What did, you th what did that experience mean to you? What do you think makes a good mentor? That's a lot of questions all thrown in there, all together looking at effective mentorship. And this can be formal, this can be informal. I've had many career mentors in my life, some of whom have no idea that I consider them to be a mentor because it's informal. It's something that I look to them. Um, we meet on a regular basis, but it's never been something where I've called them a mentor um, specifically. Um, but but essentially, that's what it is. I have, I have a bunch of people that I consider to be mentors that have influenced me in tremendous ways. But I've also had very formal mentor relationships where I meet with uh, an upper uh, a leader in the organization. Maybe once a month we have a formal meeting, we talk about goals, um, we and, and we go through that kind of a more uh, formal process. Uh, both are good and I think both are should be explored. 
With that, I think we're out of time for today. So thank you. Think about individual level interventions and how you can